So without any further comments, I'd like to introduce Rob for you, please. Thanks, Rob. Let me make sure I've got my water strategically located here. Okay, well, thank you, Todd, for introducing me. Um, this might be a little bit confusing, Ari. Uh, I go by Ari Barillo in my publications the same way that Richard Matson does, or R.G. Matson. It wasn't my choice. It just kind of worked out that way. Um, I've been working and doing research in the Bears Ears area for about eight years total, mostly on Cedar Mesa, uh, and now increasingly in the greater Bears Ears area, Comb Ridge, Comb Wash, Butler Wash, Beef Basin, uh, a little bit in Fable Valley, and a lot on Elk Ridge, and I'll actually be talking about Elk Ridge a bit later on. This is the way the talk breaks down tonight. I have tried and tried and tried to reduce it in size as much as possible. I think I got it down to as little as 95 slides, um, I think. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, there's a lot to talk about. And really, honestly, the biggest challenge when you're talking about a place like Bears Ears is choosing you know, what to leave out. Um, I do, according to, at least according to the press release, I do have about two hours. Um, I'll try not to use all of that. I should say, uh, before really getting into this, I should say first and foremost that um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of groups, a lot of organizations, Friends of Cedar Mesa, Great Old Broads for Wilderness, Southern Utah Wilderness Association, and others. Um, I don't work for them. I'm not professionally affiliated with them. I'm friends with them, and I've done some consultation for those groups. Uh, but I'm not really here in any capacity other than really storyteller and research presenter. Um, I really love the work that they do. Uh, but I've got, I'd say I've got about 50% friends that are pro-monument and about 50% friends that are anti-monument in the southeast Utah area. Now I obviously am on the pro-monument side or I wouldn't be going out and shilling for it, but it's contentious. It really is and hopefully by the end of this you'll understand first of all what some of that contention is and secondly you'll understand why it is that it seems like a monument in that area is the way to go. So first and foremost, I'm going to be talking about a, a short history of the exploration and archaeology of the Bears Ears area. Try to orient people who don't know where it is, don't know much about it, uh, as far as um, even geographic location. I've talked to some folks in Arizona, friends of mine in Flagstaff, who don't know where this is. Um, all the way on up to people who know it, who are intimate with it, but might not know some of the, uh, you know, the intricacies. Um, I got the pleasure of working on a research project utilizing historic photography to reconstruct some of those early archaeological efforts. And so I've incorporated that into this talk, and you'll get to see some of that. I will then be presenting some of the major research projects, four of them specifically, uh, two that I'm working on, one that Ben Bellarado is doing for his dissertation at the University of Arizona, and one that Laurie Webster is working on. Those are, I think, probably the four most exciting archaeological research projects taking place to give you an idea of what sort of work we're doing there and where we're taking that in the future. And then lastly, I'll talk about the conservation efforts, sort of pick up where I left off here, successes and challenges. So first and foremost, this is Bears Ears. If you've never been there or if you've never seen a, uh, by the way, this isn't the boundary of the current National Monument, this is the proposal. But if you've never been there, I'm going to be talking a whole lot about Cedar Mesa, that's this bit. This is Elk Ridge, this is Dark Canyon, Beef Basin is up here, um, Comb Ridge, Comb Wash. It is about the most heterogeneous landscape I've ever seen, ever. Within the span of 10 miles, you can see desert, you can see canyon, you can see jungle, you can see river, you can see everything in between. It's bizarre and it's crazy and awesome. It's because of that that the place has such a wonderful and unique human history. So getting right into the early explorations and antiquarians in this area, um, the William Henry's Holmes and Jackson first set foot in the area in the 1870s, first in 1875, and then again they came back in, uh, in 76, I want to say, um, working for the U.S. Geological Survey. 
Holmes would eventually become an archaeologist. He wasn't when he first started. Um, but it's Jackson, it's William Henry Jackson that really, really helps us uh, in the endeavors that we are trying to do there because this, this is an image of one of the ruins, one of the most iconic ruins in the Cedar Mesa area in what is now Bears Ears National Monument, taken by William Henry Jackson in 1875. This is what that one looks like now. And it is astoundingly well preserved. Um, especially for the uh, ease of access in this particular area. Um, Jackson, by the way, also did us the favor of, of drawing some of the most precise diagrams and illustrations of these ruins when he and Jackson, or uh, when he and Ohms were there, so that we can also use these when we're doing reconstructive photography and find them and actually be able to see what they look like. The only thing missing, if you can't see, is this. And this, let me back up real quick. Um, oh, it doesn't actually say. Well, it was uh, drawn on August 22nd anyway. Um, 1875, it just isn't written on there. Um, next on the list to arrive in the area, at least next in the, in the historical sequence that we're concerned with, is the Hole in the Rock Party. This was a group, of, uh, a group of LDS individuals left the Escalante area in late uh, 1879, yes, in late 1879, to make their way to what's now Bluff to establish a, uh, a, a fort, to establish essentially a Mormon presence on what was then called the Navajo frontier. Their most famous, obviously, for the hole in the rock which was a corridor that they blasted through the Living Rock in Glen Canyon, now uh, out of Lake Powell, but not by much. You can boat right up to it. Um, but for all, their, uh, for all their fortitude and for all their just hardworking industriousness and in blasting their way through this huge monolith of rock, when it came to Grand Gulch in the heart of Cedar Mesa, uh, they wouldn't tangle with it. And they ended up having to go all the way to the north around, uh, around most of Cedar Mesa, up onto Salvation Knoll before dropping into Comb Wash, up over Comb Ridge, and then to uh, what is now the modern city of Bluff, or town of Bluff, where they learned to quote, I don't remember who, but to quote one of their, their members, that the San Juan River there is too thick to drink and just slightly too thin to farm. And they wound up heading north to Blanding. Moving then into uh, the more formal archaeologists, the more formal antiquarians in the area, uh, the first to make a collection of artifacts in the way of, of early archaeologists or early antiquarians was Charles Lang, um, out of, also out of Bluff, followed closely by the, uh, the brothers Charles McCloyd and Charles Graham. I don't know why they share the same first name and not last name. They are brothers, McCloyd and Graham who made a series of exp uh, expeditions there in 1892 to 1894. I've got a photo that I'll show you uh, a little later on from one of their expeditions. Um, several of the canyons there, McCloyd's Canyon and now Bullet, but originally Graham Canyon, were named after these fellows. Warren Moorhead explored the area for the Illustrated American Ma uh, Museum, Museum magazine in 1893, and there's a colorful story attached to that that I'll get a chance to tell you. And then finally, Richard Wetherill and the Hyde brothers uh, did really probably the, the most famous formative early archaeology there in a series of expeditions in 1893 to 94 and then again in 1897. I don't have a lot more to say about that. But uh, so this is what Moorhead was up to. Um, the story, if I can keep it as concise as possible, uh, the Illustrated American was a periodical at the time, kind of like Harper's, sort of a you know, general interest magazine, uh, who had been made aware of, of McCloyd and Graham's you know, wanderings, the, the Reverend Green collection, which was something, a, a collection of artifacts that was purchased um, from some of those early expeditions and excavations, and they wanted to get in on that. And, Coming up soon was something called the, uh, uh, the U.S. Exposition 
Colombian Exposition, the United States Colombian Exposition. And so they grabbed this poor fellow who had worked on uh, uh, mound builder sites and said, we're going to send you to this area, the San Juan area, and you're going to do a bunch of exploration, and you're going to do some archaeology, and you're going to deploy records, notes, from your adventures to us, and we'll publish them in real time. That was their, that was their pitch. You know, and so you'll be sending back these notes from your adventures, and they'll be coming out one, and then the next, then the next for our readers. And Warren thought they were insane. And told them, why don't you, and then eventually, hopefully, you'll come back with a big collection of artifacts, right? Skulls and stuff, because that's how it was back then, and we'll show them off at the exposition. And uh, Moore had said, why don't you just buy one of these other collections, the green collection? It sounds like a bad idea to me. And they talked him into it, to the tune of 1100 bucks. And through the course of their exploration of what would eventually become the Bears Ears area, as well as Aztec and a little bit in Chaco, they managed to lose a boat, a number of horses, most of their equipment. But they did make some of the earliest exploration drawings, maps, and very, very careful detailed notes uh, of the, the archaeology of what is now Bears Ears, especially in like the Comb Wash and Butler Wash areas. And this is one of them came out as a series of 14 short stories in the Illustrated American and wound up as a, just a, a big stack of maps, of detailed drawings, of uh, you know, boxes of artifacts. And so at least for that, despite all the calamity that they met, it was a success for about two or three years until the office burned down. And that was that. And Warren Moore had said that that was a, a fitting end. But you can still find, you can actually still find these. This, is, uh, this comes from Google, digitized by Google. It's a um, uh, public domain now. Fascinating read. Richard Mario Weatherill. Uh, this is them and part of their gang down in Grand Gulch. Uh, this is the 1893 trip. Um, this was their honeymoon. Richard and Marietta uh, had gotten married just previously, and they spent their honeymoon in the bottom of Grand Gulch. Rather famously, there was a, a blizzard that descended and threatened all these, these mummies, these you know, human remains that had been excavated by Richard Wetherill were in danger from this horribly inclement weather. And uh, so Marietta woke up with bodies right beside her, underneath the blanket in the tent, and Richard saying, well, I had to get him inside out of the snow. And <laughs> And that was her, that's how it started. That was her honeymoon. That's how it began. This is a fascinating, so this is also from 1893. This is, um, this story, and the one I told you a moment ago about, uh, about Warren K. Moorhead and the ill-fated Illustrated American Expedition. These come up again, and there's a reason for telling you these um, that I'll get back to in, I don't know, half an hour from now. Um, but this is a, an interesting story. What you're looking at here are images of what Richard Wetherill at the time called Cave 7. And uh, Cave 7 is where, first of all, it was the site, it turned out to be uh, the site of a, what appears to be a massive massacre, early massacre, although Joan Coltrane at the University of Utah has done some mtDNA work on it, or um, sorry, 14C work on it and is convinced it's not a massacre site, it's just a cemetery. She and Winston Hurst and Turner have gone back and forth over that. But certainly the site of some sort of battle at any rate, it was also the place where the basket makers were discovered. Um, Richard, and his, uh, Richard and his crew up here, including Jim Etheridge, whose name can still be found on Cave 7, um, excavated what they thought was just you know, one layer, one cultural layer of, of Pueblo occupation. And Richard just decided to keep going for who knows what reason, through sterile, 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 sterile fill, and then eventually a whole other earlier culture. Um, this was the discovery of the so-called basket-making culture that became basket maker. This was lost. This, um, the location of this was lost for almost exactly 100 years. It was discovered uh, by the uh, Wetherill Grand Gulch group, led by Winston Hurst, by Fred Blackburn, and a number of others. Um, in the early 1990s, who had gone back to do what they called reverse archaeology, looking at all the notes and all the photos and just going out and pounding the ground to try and, and trace 
the line from some of these notes from these early expeditions back to where they were on the landscape. And they were able to relocate Cave 7. It was actually lost for almost, I want to say, within two years of 100 years. After that, Herbert E. Gregory, also for the US Geological Survey, did a lot of work to the north, um, explored Fable Valley and Dark Canyon uh, in the early 1900s. Fable Valley and Dark Canyon are now part of, of Bears Ears National Pon uh, Monument. They're the northern portion. Both of them are accessible by the, the Colorado River. That's the way I would encourage you to go. If you try to get there over land, it's really, really harsh. Um, and this, uh, in the 1920s, and this is about where I'm going to end it for the early, for the historic archaeology portion. In the 1920s, Nels Nelson of the Carnegie Institution came out and led a, uh, an expedition for the Carnegie to try to, to relocate and re-record and update Richard Wetherill's sites. There were hundreds of them, hundreds. And he, Nelson only really found about, I think, 17, somewhere right around 20 at any rate. Um, so a lot of fluidity to that early information. This was one of them. So this is an image that I got from, uh, you know, for the historic photography. By the way, if you haven't figured this out, part of the portion of starting out the talk this way is to orient you so you can see the landscape and see the history and get a, a feel for some of the archaeology. And part of it is me getting to show off these really cool images, <laughs> some of which I found rotting away in the basements of museums and libraries that nobody had ever seen until now. So. Oh, you're welcome. Anyway, so this is one of Nelson's uh, from the 1920s. It was one that Wetherill had found. And here they are. Actually, you know what? I'm sorry. Wetherill had re-recorded it. It was found by Graham and, uh, uh, Graham and McCloyd. I don't know who's in this photo. Um, I know that Jim Etheridge, or exactly who's in it. I know that this is Jim Etheridge here, whose feet you can just see. I think this is Fish right here, or French, sorry. I think that's Jim French. I'm not sure who the other fellow is. This is, you see this, him hanging off the, that's the kind of thing that we're trying to dissuade in the Bears years. <laughs> and so it's, it's real fun to be, to be talking about preservation issues and conservation issues and how, how you should visit with respect these sites. And then you go, you know, people have been visiting them for 100 years, and it looks like this, and then it looks like this, and oh, by the way, don't do that. Um, it's, <laughs> It's hard to do that. It's hard to maintain that. This is what it looks like now, by the way. The, let me go back. This, at various times, people will lean stripped, stripped uh, poles, tree trunks up to try to, and they do that all over the place. That's by no means a bear's ears phenomenon. And every time they do, someone else comes along who's conscientious, knocks it down, burns it, drags it away. And then somebody comes along and puts another one. This, was, this image was taken in 2014. It still looks approximately like this. No, there isn't a tree trunk leaning up there. There was the following summer. This past summer in 2016, there wasn't. It's a coin toss. As far as modern research, these are some of the, uh, what I think are some of the most exciting pure research, so not compliance driven. Not, uh, not to do with stabilization, which Woods Canyon, by the way, is doing a phenomenal job of as we speak. But research in the pure sense of research, scientific research. Um, this one and this one, the Water Ecology Project and the Elk Ridge Pueblo One Fluorescence are components of my dissertation um, or my prospectus, what will eventually hopefully be my dissertation. This is Ben Bellarado's project. And this is Laurie Webster's project. You can actually read about this in the current issue of American Antiquity. Um, those aren't mine. I'm presenting them on their behalf so you can see some of the exciting and awesome stuff that we're doing in this area. So while I'll probably have a lot of like fluidity and alacrity talking about this one and this one, if I stumble at all on these, it's because they're not my projects. But they provided me with some fantastic slides to show you guys, so hopefully we'll be able to uh, really piece together what it is they're up to. The Elk Ridge Pueblo One Fluorescence. Elk Ridge, remember that map I showed you? Elk Ridge is where the Bears Ears are actually located. So this is Cedar Mesa, goes about down to here. This is Elk Ridge. Most of it is in the uh, Manti LaSalle National Forest, and all of it now is in Bears Ears. Here, 
sorry, here. That's where the bear's ears are. It encompasses an area of about 15,000 acres and it rises really high, about 8,000 feet. And this is, uh, this is something that you can keep your eyes peeled for. I finally was able to push it through publication at Kiva. Um, once the monument got designated, it was languishing in peer review and languishing and languishing and languishing. And then, um, you know, bear's ears got designated. It became a hot topic. And this thing has bear's ears right in the title. Um, I guess I don't have it on here, but it's called Behind the Bear's Ears. It's about the Pueblo on fluorescence. And at that point, they said, well, now we'll publish it for you. And they put it on the fast track. Deborah did, and I bless her for it. But that'll be coming out this month. But what local people, local archaeologists, local land managers have known for a long, long time is that the Elk Ridge area contains probably one of the greatest early Pueblo, or uh, as we would call it, Pueblo I in the Pecos sequence, assemblages in the entire Southwest. Um, certainly the most dense, quite possibly uh, the biggest, we're not really sure, and, and, and utterly unique. Um, it shares a lot of characteristics with uh, the Central Mesa Verde area, the Pueblo I phenomenon there, and it's completely unique and bizarre in other ways. And none of this had ever really been investigated. We've known it, they've known it, it's just, it just never made its way into the literature until I came along. And I started working at the Manti LaSalle National Forest in 2014 and the district archaeologist clued me into this enormous phenomenon that had taken place in the uplands there, in the high uplands of what is now Bears Ears. And so I set about investigating it with the help of, uh, primarily of Brian Cotting of the University of Utah, uh, a lot of input from uh, my friends Bill Leip, Larry Benson, uh, Richard Wilshusen, and just a cast of thousands, um, none of whom wanted to be co-authors. So it's gonna, it says my name on the publication, it wasn't, it was me and like 50 other people, but anyway, um, we applied just a, a whole dizzying series of, of uh, ecological and environmental parameters to try and figure out exactly what was going on up there. Um, you know, this is how dense that, that phenomenon is. And what we found was that uh, following on Larry Benson and Michael Berry's work in the greater Southwest in uh, 2009 and 2010, um, there also seems to be a coincident mega drought, as they would call it, or a, a really just a comprehensive collapse in the climate right about the time in this area where you see everybody picking up and moving north from like the Cedar Mesa area, the Comb Wash area, up onto Elk Ridge where the Bears Ears are. And it looks like putting together all this paleoecology and paleoclimatology that, that it was a an upward shift of what Ken Peterson called the dry land farming belt, and they just followed it. So all these people that were living down in these lowland areas in a much, much larger geographic area who had different sociocultural habits and different sociocultural practices all the way across this large geographic area suddenly got condensed into a smaller area and that, we think, accounts for some of the really bizarre and intense and, and cool variability that you see in this assemblage, in the P1 assemblage in southeast Utah, where you'll find households that look like they're from far ends of the continent, five feet away from each other. And we think it's because so many of them from so broad an area just got condensed up and huddled, essentially, up where the bear's ears are, owing to a collapse in the climate. And it has a number of implications uh, and a number of ancillary facts associated with it, but probably the most fascinating one for me is it has been commented upon by others, uh, specifically Jim Allison and a small group of others in 2012, that in some of the earliest full-blown Pueblo villages in this area, you'll find a strong, unmistakable correlation with twin rock formations. The pillars, twin rocks down in Bluff, um, a place called the Red Knobs, where Allison did a lot of work with ceramics, and others besides. And having 
dug into the gray literature and having gone up to Elk Ridge and seen this early Pueblo fluorescence that occurred as a result of people seeking uh, solace, essentially, during a climatic collapse, as if they were looking to the twins for salvation. It seems like they were carrying that with them from then on and articulating with twins from that point forward throughout the rest of the prehistoric sequence. This is Ben's stuff. Ben Bellarado, since 2013, has been working with a, just a cast of thousands of volunteers, including myself, folks from Crow Canyon, uh, and others besides, on what he calls the Cedar Mesa Building Murals Project. It involves all this. Uh, I'll let you read it yourself without having to, to patronize you by reading it at you. But uh, what it boils down to essentially is Ben got the idea that he wanted to, uh, to go out and do a comprehensive study looking at the, the, construct, the way that, our, that construction elements and the prehistory of the area articulate with um, building murals, which is a unique phenomenon in this area. Not unique to that area, but, the, it, but very unique in that area uh, insofar as its components. Let me show you another. Um, so things like this, or uh, famously Moon House, the paintings on the inside of Moon House. Um, they're astounding, and they're cool, and nobody's ever really studied them before, at least not in a comprehensive way. And so Ben sought to do that. Um, he's a dendrochronologist. He also works with Tom Wines, who's a famous dendrochronologist down there. Um, up there. I got to keep remembering where I am. Up there. Up there. And so, you know, as a, uh, as a component of his research, um, also recording the sites or re-recording or updating the sites and doing, where possible, tree cores to try to establish a better chronology, both for the building and spread of these murals uh, and for the sites themselves. These are his funding sources. Um, Canyonlands Natural History Association is what CNHA stands for. The rest of it, I think, is pretty obvious. Um, and what he's really, what he and his, his team of volunteers, or what I guess I should say we have been doing up there, um, <coughs> primarily involves going to places, almost exclusively involves going to places that have already been found and been visited a, a million times by visitors and trying to look at them through new eyes. Um, I think I've already just gone through all this, but uh, updating the site, re-recording, taking tree ring samples, doing a judgmental survey, and so on, um, and artifact analyses that evolve every single year. Somebody's got a brand new ceramic seriation. It's crazy, so you got to go out and see if it fits. And this is us doing some of our work. We've worked, uh, he's worked with over 40 volunteers, including myself, um, visited over 150 sites, mapped and or sampled um, 16, right? 16 sites, found 97 new murals for a total of 110. That's 97 over the ones we already knew about. Um, obtained about 330 tree ring samples with Tom Wines, and those things take forever to run, so you'll be seeing the results in probably 2050. Um, <laughs> But what we do know now is it ranges in age. The, uh, the fluorescence of, of building murals seems to range in age from the 980s to the 1260s and leaning more toward the 1260s. This is Tom Wines, by the way. This is Ben, is what he looks like. This is a painted kiva on the inside of this with a, like a, a ceramic type design, kind of like this one on my arm. Goes all the way around the inside, still there, still intact. What he's found is that there are three different types, incised, painted plaster, and inscribed. Um, we, we don't have a photo, I don't think, but incised uh, decorations are probably the most common. I think you probably know what they all look like. They just you know, scratched into the walls. Um, painted plaster decorations. This one is from a, a site. This is a, a Sally Cole image from a site that's actually been pretty heavily looted. Um, up in, I think right outside of, it's on state land, but it's in uh, the Bears Ears National Forest, or the Bears Ears National Monument now. Um, and inscribed decorations, these are some of the neatest, and they're also some of the most rare. If you can see what these are, these are sandal images. 
that have been created by, uh, by dragging and pressing fingers into wet clay into a hakal wall inside a structure. They'd never been recorded before. They've been known of, but they'd never been recorded before. Ben's also been looking at weaving technologies because there's a, a close relationship between, let me go back real quick. There's a close relationship between a lot of the decorations that he's seeing and weaving. These are sandal uh, designs on the bottoms of sandals that he proposes uh, may indeed be something like a signature. Um, think like the tartan from a kilt. So if somebody walks to, you know, if the land is, is, is a, appropriately muddy or sandy, you could walk up afterwards and go, McLeod was here, you know, something like that. Um, these, like that's a belt. Um, so it's, it seems like more than anything else, um, there is a close relationship between weaving technologies and weaving, uh, weaving tape designs and this type of mural uh, phenomenon. This is a, just a great slide that he gave me. This will give you an example of um, uh, some of the timing. Um, you know, this is, this is the AD stretch here, 1100 to 1300. Uh, these are those sandal designs I showed you. Sandal inscriptions. This is Moon House, Jail House. I don't know where that is. Um, but it looks like there was an emphasis on identity. Right, you know, right through here, right through what in that area would be like the Terminal Pueblo era. The other thing he's been doing, and this is, this is probably my favorite part, um, is he's, the man is a, he's a genius with an eye for danger. Um, and he can, he, can take, he can take you to a site that's been looted that I wouldn't be able to guess has been looted. And he can say, well, the dirt here is a little softer and looser than it should be. And that sticks a little out of place. And I can tell people have been digging here. And I don't know how that works. Uh, ben is he's a master at it. But his, um, his conclusions and what he's trying to spread and what he's trying to include in that component of his research are that these sites are increasingly threatened due to amplified visitation that a very real need to document these resources before they are lost forever exists and is a, a, a principal component of his work as well as my work. And that this is one of the main reasons why many of us in Southeast Utah are supporting increased federal protections of the area. Now he wrote, i.e. Bears Ears National Monument, really any elevated protection that we can get. This is us, um, he sent me this photo a couple of months ago, this is us recording a, a site that I had discovered by accident one morning when I was walking around uh, drinking my coffee and just got lost. Um, as in so many cases, it had probably, it sounds like it's probably been visited by earlier hikers and certainly by ranchers who just kept it to themselves. You'd be amazed what people around there know that they're not telling anyone until you find it and then they say, oh yeah, that place. So we went up and recorded it with a team of volunteers, and I noticed that my friend Connie Massingale, who is a, a wonderful, wonderful woman, one of my favorite people, a uh, longtime BLM archaeology volunteer, had helped us, but wasn't in the photo, so I went ahead and, and took care of that. <laughs> but this is us. This was the last crew that I was able to work with on Ben, uh, or with Ben on some of his work, and it's astounding, the, the stuff that he's doing. The water project. This is, uh, this is what I've been working on for the past four years with help from Joan Coltrane and Michael Lewis of the University of Utah, uh, a lot of help and insight from Bill Leip, and a lot of help and insight from Larry Benson, uh, who is just so good at answering my emails. It is primarily, or it started out primarily as a stable isotope study in order to, to, to try and use uh, water chemistry to reconstruct agricultural strategies so that we could figure out where and how people were growing enough crops to be able to live in the density that they were living in places like Cedar Mesa where there's no running water, no standing water, and it only rains for about a month out of the year. And so in order to do that, um, 
let me try to work through this as smoothly as I can. Uh, I'm going to assume, I'll just start from scratch. Uh, <laughs> isotopes, isotopes are uh, different variants of, a, of, of uh, given elements or atoms um, with varying amounts of neutrons in them, so with a different atomic weight. Uh, don't ask how they come about, it's complicated, it has to do with solar rays and stuff, but just know that there are uh, there are isotopes of just about every element. And the, the main organic elements are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. They come in two flavors, stable and unstable. Unstable isotopes are ones that over time, on a geologic time, uh, time scale, jettison that extra weight or those extra uh, neutrons. And if they do it in a predictable way, or at least a, st a statistically predictable way, you can, you can map that, you can graph it, and this is how we do things like carbon dating. When, uh, when a life form that articulates with the, with the atmosphere stops articulating with the atmosphere, which is to say dies, from that point forward, there is a more or less statistical rate at which the unstable isotopes of carbon in that, in that particular uh, element uh, or in that particular sample uh, it gets, gets jettisoned and turns back into, into carbon-12, into this, the, the base element. And we can use that to date it. Stable isotopes are isotopes that uh, keep the extra weight, and thus you, you, can't, you can't date them. I always try not to turn that into a joke. Um, but they stay that way indefinitely, and the, the benefit of stable isotopes is because, because they stay at that at that elevated weight, they keep those extra neutrons forever and ever and ever. When they're fixed into a given uh, component or material at any point, that ratio will stay stable, uh, will stay uh, essentially intact with a little bit, of, uh, little bit of wiggle for fractionation, essentially forever. And what we are looking at specifically is oxygen. Now, oxygen isotopes, um, there, are, there are two heavy oxygen isotopes that paleoclimatologists and archaeologists are con concerned with the most, and those are oxygen-16 and oxygen-18, or the heavy and light of the heavier isotopes. Um, people try to make their work more complicated than it seems. I try to do the opposite. The only thing you really need to understand to get your head around most the, the the primary components, anyway, of most stable isotope research is that heavy things are harder to lift and more inclined to fall down than light things. Light things are easier to lift, less inclined to fall down than heavy things. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's, that's it. If you can get your head around that, you can do paleodietary research, paleoclimatology, paleoecology, all of it. It's all based on that simple concept. And in this particular case, oxygen-16 being lighter than oxygen-18 evaporates more easily, and oxygen-18 being heavier than oxygen-16 falls out of the sky more readily. And based on that, paleoclimatologists have realized that if you take ice cores, and you look at the ratios of oxygen-18 to oxygen-16 going back and back and back and back and back, you'll realize that when it's hotter, there's more of uh, oxygen-18 being, um, being lifted out of the water. Um, when it's colder, there's a lot less condensation going on. You get the picture. Um, you can reconstruct, at least in a relative sense, paleoclimate by looking at the ratios of these isotopes because of the way that they move through the atmosphere based on their weight. And then in the early 1980s, uh, a number of scientists, including Jim Elringer at the University of Utah uh, and Ken Peterson, struck upon the idea of doing the same thing with, with tree rings. Because trees, uh, they don't migrate. They don't eat Italian food one day and then Mexican food the next. They are, you know, they're the plants. They stay in one place and they're reflective of the, of the local environment. So if you can treat tree rings the same way that these folks were treating ice cores, you can reconstruct paleoclimate that way and you can get it down to a much, much finer grained resolution. You can look at microclimate. You can look at local trends right around where those trees were found. 
And so for, uh, based on that, they came up with a method to extract these oxygen isotope ratios from plant cellulose. And then, well, I don't want to get into my spawnies yet. Um, and then finally, the last stage of that, uh, of that story was my advisor, Joan Coltrane, along with David Williams and Jim Elringer in about 2005, said, well, what if we, what if we do that with corn, with maize, maize fossils? Um, or what are called macro fossils, they're not actually fossils. Um, would you be able to do that? Would you be able to extract cellulose, uh, oxygen isotope ratios from corn that was found in archeological sites? And if you could, would that tell you how they were growing it? Because irrigation relies mostly on snow melt. Irrigation relies mostly on uh, melted snow moving downward in a given topography and filling waters, uh, filling rivers, filling streams, creeks, things like that. Snow melt forms very, very high snow, very, very high, very, very cold. So it's gonna be far more negative in terms of uh, oxygen isotopes. Direct rainfall on the other hand, summer, warm, closer to the ground, it's gonna be a lot heavier. So if you can figure out those ratios of heavy to light isotopes, in corn, in maize, in these maize macrofossils, you might be able to figure out how these people were watering their corn without having to dig, without having to destroy sites. Uh, and they came up with a model in 2005, tested it experimentally, and published. And then myself and my colleague Michael Lewis came along, and uh, it fell to us to test it in the field. And we chose Cedar Mesa. And there's a reason we chose Cedar Mesa, and that is because uh, as far as I can tell, the secret to happiness in life really boils down to three components. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's simple. Figure out what you really want to do, figure out where you really want to do it, and then find some sucker to pay for it. <laughs> and that, no. And what I really want to do with my life is go hiking in the Four Corners area forever and ever and ever. And it turns out I'm better at science than I am at being an adventure guide and keeping people safe. So, researcher it is. And these were the folks that paid for me to do that. Um, this is essentially what we were looking at. Uh, the classic model as described by R.G. Matson. It was assumed that what folks were doing is planting in deep aeolian soils with good soil moisture retention. We get about half of our uh, moisture during the winter as a result of winter storms being blown across the land by the Pacific Gulf Stream. Um, when that snow melts into the soil, you just you simply uh, you know drop drop your maize seed deep into the soil and pray and twist your fingers together and, and hope that there's enough retained soil moisture to crack, sprout, and germinate until this comes along uh, about halfway through the uh, through the summer. The monsoonal rains that get lifted out as a result of, of heat in the lowlands creating a reverse cyclone effect. Monsoonal rains hit right when the corn needs the water the most, fills out its cobs, and you're good. Um, risky, really risky, quite a gamble, especially if you don't have a farmer's almanac to rely on uh, or the ability to, to truck in water. But that's what we were testing. Um, this is us testing it, me, um, these are some of the, this is what I was talking about, macrofossils. They're not stone, we just call them macrofossils. This was fun, um, sitting under streams for, or springs for upwards of an hour, just getting it drip by drip by drip by drip by drip by drip by drip, drove me completely insane. Uh, but we looked at real-time data from the, the King Gulch Raw Station, that's remote access weather station. We looked at cellulose from proxy plants. We looked at spring water, rain water. We looked at ground moisture, records of precipitation, and finally archeological maize cobs. And what we found is that, uh, is that Matson's insight was, was approximately correct. Um, it looks like no matter where they're planting, uh, they're relying on soil moisture, which is more or less stable all the way across the land. And then, let me move ahead real quick. And then uh, the oxygen isotope ratios for the later part of the season indicate that they were all drinking nothing but rainwater. 
in both Cedar Mesa and Elk Ridge, so both the lower and upper portion of Bears Ears. So now we know that they were obligate dry farmers. And I mean, when you look at some of the things, some of these astounding cliff dwellings that they've built, some of these castle-like pueblos that they built, and the way that they did that was to just drop their maize seed in the ground and pray and hope that the rain arrives on time. This was kind of a little bonus. We also discovered that in this area there is a, a really exaggerated what's called altitude effect, which is the, uh, the change in the ratio of heavy to light car uh, oxygen isotopes. Uh, as a result of evaporation as the water falls from the cloud to the ground, which is usually taken to be uh, moot or negligible. Um, and that's because the published literature says it's moot or negligible. And so far as we can tell, that's because the published literature is biased by people studying rain in places where it rains. And right, if you want to study the, the, the chemical constituents of rainwater, you don't want to do it in the desert unless you're crazy. We did. We did that. And what we found is that the evaporative demand in places like this is extreme. Upwards of, I don't know if this will mean anything, but upwards of between one and a half and two and a half parts per mil per uh, 1,000 feet. Whereas the literature says it's closer to about one part per mil per 1,000 meters. And the, the implications of this, uh, we're not even really sure yet. But if you'll recall early on in the story about this part of, uh, of this research that we've been doing down there, all of this was devised for paleoclimate. All of this was derived from efforts to put together climate trends from the past. They didn't know about this. In fact, we haven't published yet, so they still don't know about this. So all of those studies that have been done looking at tree rings in this area to try and reconstruct paleoclimate are probably going to have to be looked at again. Lori Webster. Wonderful woman uh, has been working for, or working with uh, Don Simonis, recently retired of the Bureau of Land Management in Monticello, on a project funded again by Canyonlands Natural History Association. This is the Perishables project. This is one of the. I'm ending on this, even though it's not mine. I still want to end on this one because it's just one of the coolest things you'll see. Uh, this again, you can read all about in the current issue of American Antiquity. But the Cedar Mesa uh, Perishables Project is something that Lori Webster came up with based on the fact that at all of these locations, and I want to say even some others, um, collections from that first portion of the talk by people like Wetherill, people like uh, Guernsey, and Graham, and McCloyd, and uh, Lang, and all those folks are just spread to the four winds. And in some cases, they're, they're poorly provenienced. In some cases, they're, uh, they have not been studied or they've been misidentified, it turns out. Um, and Lori thought it would just be great. It'd be great fun and it would be a great learning tool to go out and find these, uh, where these collections are housed, investigate them, record them, uh, and hopefully, eventually, I think, turn it into a book. I think that's Lori's uh, end game. But it's just... It's, it's, I hate to say this, but it's essentially the same motivation that I had to do my study and the same motivation that Ben Bellarado had to do his studies. It's just a great way to, to look at fun stuff um, and be able to share it with the public and to articulate with the prehistory of the area in a beautiful way and with the people there, the tribes, the modern uh, native communities. Of the 5,000 plus artifacts recovered, Uh, about 4,000 or 80% of them are perishable organics. So textiles, baskets, uh, hides, wooden implements, and feather objects. And since 2011, um, Lori, along with uh, Aaron Geerty, who hopefully made it tonight, maybe not. I'm envious of her for her job. She works at Flag National Monuments. Uh, Louis Garcia, who's a Pirotiwa, Pueblo Weaver, and also kind of a cultural informant for Lori, uh, and Chuck LaRue, a wildlife biologist, who is um, 
He's an ace at looking at things like a cape full of feathers and telling you exactly what bird it was and how many of them, upwards of like 10,000 of these things. I couldn't do it, I'd go crazy. And just to show you some of the amazing things they found, this is an 1800 year old twine bag filled with cornmeal from Grand Gulch. These are the upper and lower faces of woven sandals with a buckskin fringe. And one thing that Lori uh, told me, or told a bunch of us at a presentation not long ago, it also turns out there's uh, human hair woven in. This is a painted yucca uh, tump band from Battle Cave. That's not Cedar Mesa, thankfully, uh, elsewhere in the, the bear's ears. Um, and this is a close up. This is one of my favorites. These are dice. Isn't that crazy? I found that, so after she showed me what these look like, I've actually found them in sites. Um, I wouldn't have had any idea what they are. But uh, so I, it's amazing the, the, the cultural um, parallels that you'll sometimes come upon. We do the same thing. A cup with dice, you shake, and then you roll uh, all the way down to the cup. But apparently, you know, there's designs on the side of these things, and it would just, it would be a matter of like what side was up when it would roll. And I had no idea, I mean, uh, dice. I had no idea there were dice. This is a Pueblo era bow and drill with a hafted bit. Um, if you've ever seen people using the, the bow method to start a fire, they, uh, they figured out somewhere along the line that if you do the same thing with a sharp, sharp bit of stone at the end of it, you can drill a hole. Um, so another piece of, of ancient technology that I think is fascinatingly modern. Repair kit. <laughs> Repair kit. I like that. <laughs> um, and this, uh, so this is a Basket Maker 2 men's wooden hair ornament. This is, Basket Maker 2 was the first formative culture. Remember what I said about Richard Weatherall and the gang in Cave 7 finding the Basket Makers? They were the first. That means this thing is probably at least 2,000 years old. So that's what Lori's been up to. Lastly, the tricky part. I'm going to pick up approximately where I left off at the beginning with the early antiquarians and the early uh, archaeological efforts because they meld right into early conservation efforts. Um, we'll talk about some of the challenges, and uh, hopefully it won't get too dire. And, of course, I saved the last challenge for last because it's the one I want to talk about the least. Um, so early attempts, early attempts at conservation and preservation in this area. Uh, in 1903, Mitchell, T. Mitchell Pruden, Dr. Pruden, uh, if you ever heard of a Pruden unit in archaeology, it comes from this guy who's a friend of uh, Richard Wetherill's, published a book. This is an image from that book. It's now uh, uh, public domain as well. And said, it is hoped that steps may be taken to protect these relics of most instructive phase of primitive culture and that authorized and intelligent research may be encouraged. Um, so a little dated, primitive culture. We probably wouldn't say that now. Um, but this was in 1903 that T. Mitchell Pruden was saying this. And he was saying this after doing an investigation in, the, in the, the San Juan area in and around what is now uh, Cedar Mesa, as well as Mancos and Mesa Verde. In 1906, Congress created the Antiquities Act. I will definitely be coming back to that. Um, but it was in response to uh, rampant looting taking place in the Four Corners region, including uh, looting that was pointed out by A.B. Kidder, who was working on Alkali Ridge which is now technically outside of the Bears Ears National Monument, what was included in the, uh, in the proposal. This comes from uh, Kidder's fantastic little volume uh, published in, I want to say, 1908, in which he says relic seekers are ruining a lot of these sites. Um, luckily, in 1910, the robbery of ruins was stopped. And if you believe that, so this is Byron Cummings. I was just actually talking to uh, some of the folks at BVAC about Byron Cummings earlier, but in 1910, um, went on a trip 
in this area, the Bears Ears area, with these folks. That's Cummings. And, and, and just raised a stink about the, uh, the state of, of many of these, uh, these resources just getting looted and pillaged and destroyed. Um, this article came out in the, uh, uh, the Salt Lake Tribune in 1910, in which Cummings said that he, uh, quote, had met with success in interesting state and government in the protection of vast historic wealth of Southeast Utah. Um, it is now 100 years later, and we've kind of gotten there. This is one of my favorite images of all time. So if you can't see, this thing has had coffee spilled on it, it's had wine spilled on it, it's been stepped on. Um, but this image, this is a map of the original, uh, the original proposal for the Escalante National Monument in 1936. Would have stretched all the way over to include Cedar Mesa, to include Beef Basin and Indian uh, Creek up here. So basically everything that is now Bears Ears except the Manti Lasal. Um, you probably well know that Escalante is a lot smaller than that. Uh, but this, this was a, just a, a, a great discovery. I didn't even know this existed until I was doing the research for uh, the historic photography project. But even back in 1936, they were proposing to protect these lands going all the way to Blanding and Monticello and all the way up to the confluence of the Green and Colorado Rivers. Um, didn't work, obviously. Between the following year and 1962, a lot of overtures were made uh, to, uh, to expand Natural Bridges National Monument to include parts uh, or most of Cedar Mesa. So this is an old, this is a map from, from about that era. This is Natural Bridges National Monument as it existed in, I wanna say 1940. Um, so this is the Arch Canyon area in the north portion of uh, Cedar Mesa. This of course up here is Elk Ridge. Here's the Bears Ears right here. So they were proposing for it to go like that. It was on the fast track to having that happen. And then Hitler happened and and that was that. Uh, we got distracted by World War II. It got backburnered, and then it just sort of lost its, it, you know, it lost its steam. Uh, by 1962, eventually, it was just abandoned. But for, you know, right around three decades or so, folks were trying to expand uh, natural the boundary of Natural Bridges National Monument to include a lot of what is now Bears Ears. So people have been trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. It's quite a history. The BLM, for their part, uh, designated the Grand Gulch Primitive Area in 1971. Grand Gulch is the crown jewel of, uh, depending on who you ask, the crown jewel of Cedar Mesa. Uh, the Dark Canyon Wilderness Area was designated, it's the first wilderness area designated in, in all of the United States in 1984. Uh, that's on the Mantia LaSalle National Forest, now Bears Ears. Um, following which, there was a proposal in 89 by the BLM for a 440,000 acre national conservation area that got shot down. There has been off and on until basically this year, until Bears Ears happened, there's been off and on a proposal by folks like Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance for a greater canyon lands that includes Cedar Mesa, Elk Ridge, Beef Basin, uh, starting in 1935, evidently. So starting, you know, as a, uh, as a rival to the Escalante proposal. And things really ramped up starting in about 2010, 2012. Friends of Cedar Mesa, a conservationist group based out of Bluff, put together a proposal for a uh, national conservation area and a, uh, a group called the Dine Bikea, or Utah Dine Bikea, which is a Navajo group, put together their own proposal for a national conservation area at about the same time to include not just preservation of the land, but to include Native American involvement. This is where it, it started. This is where that idea first got out there. It was in 2012 with Dine Pikea. This is what they were proposing. Everything in a hash mark here would include uh, co-management, co-administration involving the tribes. At the same time, or by about 2014, Utah state legislatures 
uh, Utah State Legislature members, I want to say uh, specifically Rob Bishop, along with Noel Lee and a few others, Chaffetz of course, uh, decided to, uh, that it was, it was prudent to come up with an alternative, a stateside alternative. And their alternative was uh, the Public Lands Initiative. And they spent years collecting statements from local ranchers, from uh, local hikers, conservationists, Native Americans, scientists, archaeologists, anybody who could chime in until it was actually time to put the PLI together and then all those statements went straight into the toilet. Um, the PLI itself, uh, it never even got voted on. It was proposed this past fall, or it was, it was floated in Congress this past fall. It was, never given a, it was never given a vote, never even made it to the floor. The Intertribal Coalition, meanwhile, in 2015, um, so far as I, I, as I understand it, as it was explained to me by uh, Willie Grayeyes and some of the other folks involved with the, the coalition, they were, they were involved in the PLI process. They thought it was, it was going to work out just fine until they realized that all those statements being collected in San Juan County, Wayne County, Armory County were being ignored. And it was at that point they said, well, we've got to do this on our own. Um, teamed up with uh, Friends of Cedar Mesa who dropped their National Conservation Area proposal in order to you know, help out toward the grander cause. And put together what is now called the Intertribal Coalition that involved the Zuni tribe, Hopi, Ute, Ute Mountain Ute, which is a different and autonomous tribe from the Southern Utah Ute, and of course Navajo. Uh, in well, later on that same year, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center set off a letter saying by 120 archaeologists, which included this fantastic quip by Bill Life, it is time to recognize Bears Ears area for the national treasure that it is. The Bears Ears area has great potential for future archaeological research, as well as productive collaborations between scientific researchers and Native American groups. I said earlier, keep that in mind. That is, that is the key component to what we've really been trying to do there. This is the Intertribal Coalition. This is a photo they sent me. Um, this is a view of the Bears Ears most people don't get to see. It's the backside. That's what Elk Ridge looks like. Um, covered in snow two-thirds of the year, but it's really green and lush and high. In the summer of 2016, this, was, this is where things really boiled over. In the summer of 2016, a public hearing was held in Bluff where local citizens could come and make comments and give, uh, you know, give two-minute talks to Sally Jewell, Interior Secretary, as well as Neil Cornsey and other uh, key players in the, the federal land management agencies. Bluff is a town of 300. About 300. 2,000 people, we, we assume, maybe more, but at least 2,000 people showed up for this little soiree. Um, boy, it was a sight to see. It was almost as historic as the monument itself. This is what it looked, this was the line to get in. And what you don't see is over, you know, so over like here, and then over here, there were tents, big circus-like tents for everyone that didn't even bother getting in line to go inside. They just wanted to hang out outside, kind of like the people outside a Grateful Dead show. They're just <laughs> listening to the things being piped outside by speakers, and they just, you know, it was crazy. Absolutely crazy. People on the inside got to enjoy a little bit of air conditioning, and that's where the microphone was to talk to Sally Jewell and everybody else. This is what it looked like inside. See all the blue? So these are the, the, the blue shirts. It was, it's a lot like the show Firefly. It was uh, the blue shirts were pro bear's ears. The brown shirts, there's a big you know, conglomeration of them back here. They were pro PLI, anti-monument, uh, quote-unquote locals, mostly locals. I took a picture of these two um, after I was standing outside and I chatted with them for a little bit. And I wanted to be sure to include this because these things, like I said, they can be really, really contentious. And these two were, were two of the nicest people I've ever met, just this lovely young couple. And it's important to bear in mind that the folks that are, that are opposed to many, not all, but many of the folks that are opposed to the monument, they are very much in favor of protecting the land. You know, they live there, they go out every single day, they love it. 
They love it and they know it way more than people who go there and spend one weekend out of the year. They just don't trust the feds. They wanted local protection. But it's not, they're not a bunch of, of yokels. They're not a bunch of looters. They want the land protected as much as anyone else. They just want it to be a local uh, effort. And so they were in favor of Bishop's PLI, which again, kind of a lead balloon. This is one of my favorite uh, images of all time. This was provided to me by Josh Ewing. That's Sally Jewell freaking out at uh, Moon House. We were told, so I was working for the Forest Service at the time. We were told that Interior Secretary Sally Jewell was coming and that she likes to hike. And just being the types of people we are, <laughs> we thought, well, okay, there's a few sites that we could probably, you know, they're paved, you can walk up, you know. And we're very quickly corrected. No, 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 she's like, she runs marathons. Like she likes to hike. And it was, <laughs> I love her. Oh, she's amazing. Um, yeah, she's a, she's a beast, that woman. Like some of, Vaughn Haddonfelt and Josh Ewing took her there and uh, were running to keep up with her. And they are <laughs> legendary, those two. And then it happened. The PLI didn't, uh, again, didn't even get voted on. It didn't get voted in or voted out. It wasn't even voted on. Trump got elected on November 8th, and we thought, we, we honestly, we thought we were holding our breaths. There was not gonna, not gonna be any protection at all. There was so much opposition to the monument and the local community, and so much support for the PLI that just sank like a pre-sunken ship that we thought we were gonna wind up with neither monument nor public lands initiative. And for about a month and a half, we were sweating bullets. And then this happened. The original monument called for the protection of 1.9 million acres. The monument as it stands now protects 1.35 million acres. What was excluded is uh, the Red, Red Canyon area much to the enormous chagrin of my friend Rob Gay, paleontologist. Um, some of the finest dinosaurs in North America can be found in this area, but so can a lot of uranium. So they threw a bone, they threw a bone. Um, you can read about that and uh, there's a, a paper, an article that came out in the Denver Post and San Juan, uh, the Cortez Chronicle, so probably a dozen other newspapers besides, just like three, four days ago about that. Um, Rob Gay is quoted in it, misquoted according to him. But this is something I put together for uh, the Center for Desert Archaeology. They asked me to put together, to help them put together a poster or something for what they know is going to be the bigger fight, which is to keep the thing. Um, the native community, obviously, uh, especially the ones that were involved, were, were just, they were ecstatic. They were out of their heads. And out of deference, to, uh, uh, deference to, to, to cultural norms and cultural respect, I'm only showing the one image that I was told, go ahead and show. And this, so this is Willie Gray Eyes, my good friend, um, the chair of the Utah Dinebekea, trying his best not to look excited, trying not to let his enthusiasm show. Um, and that's the best he could do. One of my favorite people, Willie. So then the challenges. We got the monument now. Now it's time to face some of the realities. Uh, some of which you may have heard about already, the political, certainly, people have heard about. But others, like this one, I don't think are getting any attention. And that's what's really concerning me and concerning a lot of others in southeast Utah. So the beginning, um, over-visitation. I mentioned this in Ben Bellarado's research earlier. Jerry Spangler on two different occasions, way before, way before any of this Bears Ear stuff started, said ruiner lovers can be unwittingly ruinous, and tourism, uh, he called the top threat to ancient Indian ruins. Um, this is a graph that I borrowed from, um, I borrowed from a publication by Stephen Jay Gould, evolutionary biologist. I think he in turn got it from somebody else. But I spent about a year studying uh, human behavioral trends and models and how we can use that sort of information to try and, and, and anticipate how we can react 
to people impacting these ruins and impacting places that are archaeologically rich. Um, so this is something called the Drunkard's Walk, nicknamed the Drunkard's Walk. It's a way for evolutionary biologists to account for things that look like progress in the evolutionary record when evolution is supposed to be random. And uh, the way it works is if you've got a left limit, randomization, as random as it may be, really has nowhere to go. And the reason it's called the drunkard's walk is because Stephen Jay Gould invites us to picture a drunk stumbling home with every step he takes, it's 50% one direction or the other, 50% one direction or the other. But on one side, there's a wall. And if you hit the wall, you stop. 50%, 50% hit the wall, you stop. So eventually, whether sooner or later, the drunk's going to wind up in the gutter. Because the left limit is going to push, and that's how statistics works. This left limit, uh, that's the internet. In what uh, was, was beautifully, I think Jeffrey Rosen um, in the New York Times beautifully called the end, uh, the age of the end of forgetting. We live in a time now where information doesn't go away. It can't go away. It has nowhere to go. There's a left limit. Uh, remember, I, I told you before that these were going to come up again. Remember the story about Cave 7. Remember the story about Warren Moorhead. Maps were lost. Pictures were lost. Things, uh, it, and, and even you know, right up until about 20 years ago, somebody finds some really cool, really fragile archaeological ruin. Maybe they don't tell anybody. Maybe they do tell people, but then they forget about it. They lose their maps. Information used to be lost sometimes. It can't anymore. Which means the obscurity strategy, the don't tell nobody nothing and they'll never find it strategy, will not work. All it will do is delay. And this is the model that I put together in my, uh, at the end of that publication. Um, September 2016, SAA archaeological record, by the way, if you want to read it. Uh, this is the relationship between attention or awareness on the one hand and destruction on the other hand. And everybody knows about this. If you've got too much attention, too many people, uh, things, are, things are at risk. People are going to beat it into the ground. They're going to love it to death. This is the part that I think a lot of people don't, uh, either don't know about or don't appreciate. It's just as dangerous to have nobody know about these resources, especially on public lands, as it is to have everyone know about them. Because if nobody knows they're there, you have these what are called alpha impacts. Natural erosion, cattle, looters, vandals, and of course, uh, development. If nobody knows it's there, nobody's lifting a finger to protect it. If everybody knows it's there, everyone's lifting a finger and tearing it down. So where's this? Where's the optimum? Just enough people know about it to protect it. Not too many people know about it that's getting destroyed. I don't know. You tell me. This is what we have to aim for. And with that, uh, a real quick story. Um, keep this image in mind. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this ruin, and then I'm going to come back to this image. Um, this is located in the Bears Ears area. It is perched way, you see how, how sheer this cliff is? It's perched way up on a, on a sheer cliff inside an alcove, clinging to the rock. I don't even know how. And right in here, in this area here, are these. So the only way, this is what it looks like backed out. So these steps right here. So if you want to get into this thing, the only way to get into it is to either you know, lean a tree against it or have one of your friends hoist you up. Then you grab this stick that's been wedged there, sitting on bare rock, 20 feet in the air, and pull yourself up. And I came along one day hiking, and these, uh, they had done it, this, this group of um, uh, young fellows. And I said, and I swear to God, I said, guys, I'm not going to go up there because it's dangerous and furthermore illegal. But can you take some photos for me? <laughs> and they said, yes. And I tossed the camera. So I tossed my camera up, and they took these pictures. There were four of them, one here taking the photo, this guy, these two, 
took photos of themselves and the ruin and threw the camera back down to me. <laughs> this is the kind of thing we're worried about. How'd they get up there? Oh, that, that, one of them lifted one up, grabbed the steps, oh, okay. pulled themselves up. Man ladder. Exactly, and then they just reached down and pulled each other up. Yeah. Holding on to these things that have been wedged into rock on rock Skinny. for about 900 years. Kid. Yeah. Crazy kids. This is an image from uh, uh, Canyon Country Zephyr, uh, put out by a guy named Jim Stiles in Moab. Really cool guy, very opinionated. Um, it's a political cartoon, so it's obviously exaggerative, but I love it. Um, this is something else we're concerned about. So, Bears Ears, Bears Ears has been from day one a native-led initiative. I helped, I helped this much. Friends of Cedar Mesa, Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance, Great Old Broads, and a whole bunch of other people besides Jonathan Bailey and Kevin Jones and others that I, I can't even count. We all helped about this much. But the lion's share of credit for Bears Ears belongs and will always belong with the tribes. And for them, it's sacred, and that's the reason they did it. And there is a big, big dialogue going on right now between how they were able to push the proposal through and the way the place is being advertised. They created a proposal based on a place that's sacred, that's being advertised as a playground. That's a problem. A fellow named Lyle Belenqua, who is a Hopi archaeologist, by the way, coming from New England, as I did originally, or upstate New York, I didn't know that was a thing. I, I'll just say it. Uh, back east, that's where all the colleges are. That's where none of the enlightenment is. You gotta come out west to get that. So really, I mean, so you know, coming from, coming from New England, coming from the New England area, I thought you know, Native Americans and archeologists are like the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know? And that was true. Uh, for a long time, and it is still true in some places, Utah, but uh, boy, I, you know, I met Lyle in 2006 when I was tending bar at the Mogollon up in Flagstaff. He introduced himself as a Hopi, Hopi archaeologist, and I just thought, like, that's like saying hot ice, you know? And, but Lyle and I have been friends ever since, and he is a key, uh, a, a key player in the, the effort to protect Bears Ears. And at the Celebrate event, uh, he addressed this. And he emphasized, as my friend Jason Nez, who's a Navajo archaeologist, recently emphasized in a talk at the Grand Canyon that I encourage you to look up online. It's great. It's on Vimeo. Um, balance. Because it's, you're always going to get these, you're always going to get these conflicts. You're always going to get these conflicts of usage. If I think it's sacred and that person thinks they can walk all over it, or if that person is is being a respectful visitor and hates the fact that I think it's sacred and don't want them anywhere near it, that's always gonna be a little bit of conflict. But you always have to bear in mind, you wouldn't be able to walk on it at all. And it wouldn't be there to be sacred if it wasn't protected. So this internecine warfare doesn't get us anywhere. It's important to remember that the end goal is still the same. And I love Lyle for that, for saying that. Um, something else that Lyle did, and I asked his permission to repeat this, and uh, because I loved it. At the Celebrate event, he told a story about uh, a, federal, uh, a federal land management effort that involved gathering together a bunch of Hopi uh, elders and informants and asking them, giving them a bunch of maps and asking them, uh, circle what's sacred so that we know, you know, so we can plan our... <laughs> and everybody circled, well, yeah, that happened, but everybody circled something different, you know, and, because this, I was taught this, well, I was taught this, well, I'm from this clan and this is important. And you know, the, the federal agencies uh, folks were getting frustrated and finally the leader of the Hopi coalition or the Hopi contingent said, all right, hang on, I've got, I've got an idea. Uh, so he said, all right, we're gonna do a little exercise. He said, start, start with a picture of the world, the whole world, start with that, okay? And then stop right there. That's what the Hopi considers sacred. So conflict is inevitable. You've just got to find a way to work together. Dangerousness. 
I wasn't sure how to put that, and I thought I'd just give you a laugh. I don't know. But that sign, so that sign's not from anywhere near Bears Ears. It's actually near the Grand Canyon. Specifically, the little Colorado River Gorge. And the reason I put that up there, before getting into anything to do with Bears Ears and danger, is because I've got a friend in Flagstaff, two friends actually, a married couple, uh, with whom I used to work uh, when I lived and worked at the Grand Canyon. And I told them if they came, I would tell a story with him in it. And they came. So it's 2005, I'm living at the Grand Canyon, and uh, a friend of mine, an old high school friend of mine, came to visit. He wanted to hike across the Grand Canyon, rim to rim. I couldn't get the time off work, so I asked my friend, who now lives in Flagstaff, to please take him across. Just to relieve tension and kind of give out the spoiler, they were fine, my friends are in good shape, they knew what they were doing, they're not stupid, and, you know, they did, they did great. But they get to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it's summer. It's summer and it's the bottom of the Grand Canyon and they find this gentleman, young guy, red as a lobster, nearly blind from sun damage, uh, stumbling along, in one hand he's got an empty Gatorade, like this, and in the other hand, at least he's got a map, at least. Or so it seemed. But what turned out on closer examination to be not a map so much in the formal sense as a placemat from the El Tavar restaurant <laughs> with a drawing of the Grand Canyon on it. And that's how he was navigating. Now, as far as I know, that guy lived. Not, ever, not all of them do. And the reason that I bring this up uh, is because of that playground aspect that we, we just have to learn to live with in this place that we think is so scientifically valuable and so sacred. The fact that it's being, uh, that, that people keep saying over and over again, this place is really fun, it's really beautiful, you should all come and see it. Nobody's talking about how dangerous it is. This is one of the most rugged landscapes I've ever seen. There aren't many places that are as dangerous as the Grand Canyon, but there are a few in the Bears Ears area, the ones that spring immediately to mind in the summer months, Fable Valley, Slickhorn Canyon. Last summer I was backpacking through the middle portion of Grand Gulch. Grand Gulch, as I said, is the crown jewel of Cedar Mesa. It's where most of the visitors who go there to go hiking go, which means it's honestly one of the more tame canyon systems in the Cedar Mesa and Bears Ears area. And I am a conscientious hiker, I wasn't always. There are legends about the idiocy I got involved in, but I'm a conscientious hiker at this point. I carry water, food, I check what, uh, the weather, I look at the moon cycles, I have a spot device, and yet, backpacking through the middle portion of Grand Gulch last summer, at one point the walls began to look like this. This is a photo of myself that was taken by my hiking partner not long after it began to rain. Um, I show you this because when you're hiking through Grand Gulch, the middle portion of Grand Gulch, you're not walking on the bottom of the canyon floor. You're walking in the bottom of a deep arroyo cut in the canyon floor. And this is, I mean, this is a good seven to eight feet above my head. And we got to where we were camping, which is a high wide bench in front of a place called uh, Greenhouse Spring. One of the only high wide benches in this portion of the, of the gulch. Now listen to this sequence of events. We clamber out of there and up onto the bench. We walk into the middle of the bench where we're gonna, you know, this, this terrace where we're gonna camp. We unbuckle our, our packs, we sit on a log, we start to undo the laces on our boots. Start. We didn't even get to unlace, uh, unlace our boots. So 15 seconds total, about 15 seconds. And we hear this. Now that picture I showed you, the reason I showed you that picture you see how high that is? That's right there. Wow. That water was about 12 feet deep in 15 seconds. We didn't even hear it coming. It was dumb luck that I'm telling you this story now without telling it to you from you know, a seated position. That landscape is one of the most dangerous places I've ever been. I love it, it's fun. I really do encourage you to go, but God help you be careful because nobody's talking about that. And those of us who live and work in that area, BLM folks, especially local EMTs like my friend Bess down in Bluff, especially are terrified because the crowds are coming. 
Whether the monument stays or not, it's been advertised, the crowds are coming, and nobody seems to know anything about the dangers. Speaking of whether it stays a monument or not, this is the last of them. When the monument was declared on December 28th, protests immediately erupted in the towns, the nearby towns of Monticello and Blanding. This was a picture from one of them. With Utah politicians vowing to shrink uh, and or outright rescind the monument, uh, a vow that they have not let go of yet. This is another image from those same protests. This is one of my favorite. So I don't know if this is a Gary Larson cartoon or not, but it's, it's one of those what I call a cubicle cartoon. I don't know who did it, but it's a plaque or a banner, and it says plan ahead, and then there's a D written at the end of it. So right under here it says should. That's what I thought of. Um, again, again, I just I, I want to stress this as hard as I can. I disagree with the locals. 80%, by the way, 80% of the locals. I disagree with them on the monument. I think that the resources, natural, cultural, and paleontological, deserve the elevated protection of a monument. But that's kind of the only thing I disagree with them on. They love the land too. They just they want local protection. They don't want federal protection, and they haven't stopped trying. This was big, big, big news. Uh, I don't know if it made it all the way down here, but it was, yeah? Okay. Well, so for those, I guess, few of you that don't know, um, every year there's something called the uh, Outdoor Retailers Show in Salt Lake City, where Patagonia and Osprey and REI and a bunch of others gather together and raise, uh, it, it results in millions of dollars going into the local and state economy in Utah. And first Patagonia, and then Osprey, and then REI, and then eventually everybody else as retaliation uh, for the Utah State Legislature and the governor fighting as hard as they can to rescind National Monument, uh, pulled out. Pulled out. I don't know where the outdoor retailer show is going to be. I'd like it to be in Flagstaff, but it's, Flagstaff's too small. How long have we been campaigning for a Trader Joe's? Yeah. <laughs> Flagstaff is too. One more strip, one more strip mall, and, you, and you'll be there. Um, Utah Governor Gary Herbert called that a, uh, uh, I think juvenile was the word that he used. Um, it was a heavy-handed thing for them to do, but uh, they did it, and I'm, you know, I'm behind him. And what that boils down to, really, what that, what the impending and ongoing battle boils down to is this. This is the Antiquities Act, passed on June 8th by uh, Teddy Roosevelt. I decided to get back to this. As was pointed out to be by a land management lawyer, there are two components, principal components, you need to be aware of if you want to get your head around this battle and where it may or may not go. The first one is this. President is hereby authorized at his discretion to declare the Antiquities Act gives the power to create. The Antiquities Act does not give the power to rescind. So if you are to use the Antiquities Act or attack something uh, passed using the Antiquities Act, you wouldn't be able to use the Antiquities Act to do it. It doesn't give you the power. On the other hand, on the other hand, there is this shall be confined to the smallest area compatible with proper care and management of the objects to be protected. Who decides what that area is? Is it a 30 meter buffer around an archeological ruin? Is it a three mile buffer? Is it a three centimeter buffer? Litigation, those the people who make those sorts of decisions are the same people as Bill Clinton once sort of famously pointed out who get into arguments over what the word is means. <laughs> That's the chink in the armor. And at this point, we just don't know. We don't know what's going to happen next. But I'll say this as an archaeologist, uh, as well as as a, a, as a conscientious hiker and visitor of the Bears Ears area, whether or not there's a monument, whether or not there's a monument, what we've done can't be undone. The crowds are coming. The impacts are coming. 
and whether the monument is shrunk or rescinded or even expanded, those things won't change. And the reason I wanted to show this, whoops, the reason I wanted to show this, uh, I want to end on a, a kind of an unusual note. One of my favorite authors, Vine Delorey Jr., once said uh, that you can tell when the warm season has returned to the lands of his ancestors because the, the leaves turn green, the flowers bloom, and hordes of locusts descend, <laughs> clipboards in hand, calling themselves anthropologists. <laughs> and and it's, it's, we've, we've come a long way since then. We really have. Uh, but in Bears Ears, that the aforementioned Hopi archaeologist Lyle Belenqua, when he was uh, giving his talk, called out specifically by name myself and my good friends Ben Bellarado and Lori Webster, along with rock arts uh, specialist Sally Cole, and said, you know, we represent a step beyond even the step beyond that, beyond mandated tribal consultation, full and equal partnership. Uh, the research that we're doing with Hopi archaeologists like Lyle, with Navajo archaeologists like Jason, this is something, uh, this is the epicenter of that. It is, a, it is a, an open and equal community. And that's what we've really done there. And Zen practitioners for a very long time, that's what this is, Zen practitioners for a very long time have, have taught that one of the chief sources of suffering and one of the chief uh, indices of ignorance is focusing or over fixating on a symbol rather than the thing that it symbolizes. And they always invoke the heuristic of a finger pointing at the moon. If you focus on the finger instead of the moon, you're missing the point. The classic example of this is money. Money isn't wealth, money is a symbol. Now, if you're cold, if you're starving, if you're homeless, if you're sick and you're obsessing over money, yeah, I'm kind of with you on that. But if you've got you know, clothes on back, food and belly, roof overhead, and you're feeling in more or less good health, and you're obsessing over money, you're missing the point. You're obsessing over the symbol. You have the wealth. And the protection that is afforded by Bears Ears National Monument for the cultural, for the natural, and for the paleontological resources there is a political reality. It is a literal reality. And that can't, be dis that can't be ignored, and it needs to be fought for if you really believe in it. But over and above even that, it's a symbol. It's a symbol of native voices finally being heard, and it's a symbol of the progress that we are making. And the things that we're doing there can't be undone. The history that we've made there can't be unmade. And we will not stop in that march toward progress that we are on in Bears Ears because people attack a symbol. That's it. If you don't get the joke here, uh, Mike Knoll said last summer that the only digging that's happening in archaeological sites in Utah is by badgers in response to the looting problem. So myself and Jonathan Bailey and uh, Pat Bagley and a few others have decided to um, do things like this as often as we can. <laughs> Before I get into the question section, uh, two things I, want, I need to do real quick. Uh, one of them is show this. This is everybody that helped. Uh, either helped with my research or helped on this presentation or both. Um, not all of them are even pro-monument. But that's the point I'm making. What we're really doing down there is only ancillary to the monument. What we're really doing down there is something altogether different and exciting. It's history making. And the other thing I want to do is just say thank you. This is a, a massive turnout. And I'm, I've never, I never am more happy than when I have an excuse to come home to northern Arizona. And that's what these kind of talks really are. Um, they get important messages out there. They get my name out there. They can further my career and my goals. But um, it's a reason to come home. It always makes me happy. So I think we've only got one mic, right? Or do we have another one? OK. Does anybody have any questions? You might have to yell them. I've got a question. Yes.
What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, cultural continuity is, is just as strongly demonstrated here uh, as it is at places like Lizard Man Village. Um, actually, Lizard Man Village is in Bears Ears. Anyway, it's, it, it, cultural continuity is, is for sure. Um, I, I can tell you, for example, my, uh, a colleague and friend of mine, Jonathan Till, a prolific archaeologist in this area, uh, was, was hanging out and talking to some of his, uh, I want to say, Hopi consultants, friends, um, and had gone on a site visit. And uh, the Hopi folks, he was standing, he, was, he didn't realize where he was, he was just standing, talking, pointing at a kiva over here and pointing at a Pueblo wall over there. And they pointed at him and said, you're standing on a shrine. And he didn't, because it, they're, they're so subtle, they're super subtle. And he looked down and, you know, and they had identified it by sight and he didn't even know. And he is a, you know, he's a top-notch archeologist. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's just close, close kinship ties. It's, it's very, very obvious. Nobody else? All right. Well, I'm glad I didn't bore you to death. And thanks again for coming. Thank you all for coming. Safe drive home. Thank you. Thank you.